Hello, hello. Hey, Jeff, how you doing? Hey, what's going on, Jason? Oh, not too much. Oh, there we go. Okay. I was, uh, thought my headset wasn't working for a second, but I think it's working. It is working. All right, cool. All right. <clears throat> Just finished dinner. Perfect timing. That's what I'm doing. I'm having something to eat here at my desk while we go through this. <laughs> Well, we just uh, woofed down dinner because my wife, my daughter have to go pick up uh, groceries. It's, it's funny how, uh, you know, you order all these groceries like days ahead and they still tell you like, oh, we can't have it ready until like eight o'clock, two nights from now. Oh, my goodness. <clears throat> so they're going to go grab it now. Anyways, good to see everybody. Don, I got your package, buddy. It's right here. I'm going to tackle that probably this weekend. Not a problem. We're not in a rush. Yeah, well, thanks for sending it. Um, oh, no, thanks for all the work you've been doing on those power supplies. No, I've enjoyed it. It's, uh, you know, uh, fun to have something to contribute, you know, <laughs> despite the disaster behind me. <laughs> it looks like I'm Wait never a minute, no, that, that looks to me like an optimum working space. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God, the boxes of parts and everything. It, it, crazy enough is, though, it's all like categorized, like this box for this project, this box for this. You could have said you that was a virtual. My desk. Go ahead. You could have said that was a virtual background, Jason, and then we probably would have just believed you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, this this is a picture taken from a uh, what's his name from a MythBusters, a Jamie uh, or I mean uh, Adam Savage or whatever. This is taken from a picture of his shop or something. <laughs> Actually, you guys might get a kick out of this. This is a little project I've been working on. So, you know the um. I'm sure you guys are familiar with the tracker, open tracker, tracker two, tracker three, and so forth. So I've known Scott Miller for years. We've been friends for years. And he's got the tracker three mini right now, which is basically the only tracker three that he can produce right now because that's the only thing he can get parts for. Let me see. I think I got another one here. Anyways, he um since that's basically the only thing he can produce right now, I grabbed a couple because I thought, well, let me see what I can do with them. So it's these little guys right here. I don't know if you can see it in the package. It's basically like a dip module. He the uh, version of the Tracker Three. <clears throat> well, it, it's a great little module, but you know, without all the connectors and everything, it's a little bit of a pain. So I developed a um a carrier board for it that breaks all the connections out. In fact, I think I've got a bare one here. Yeah. I'll show you what one of the bare boards looks like. But basically, it's a you know, the module goes right there, whoops, right here, and then it gives you you know the mini din and the two serial ports and everything. Anyways, so I designed it for this Hammond box, and I 3D printed some end plates for it. I'm going to change it up a little bit, but anyways, this will be a way of getting a tracker three kind of you know field usable without having to hang a bunch of stuff off of the module. So anyways, that's when one of my little side projects as though as if I needed any other projects to work on, but <clears throat> and then if anyone's into LoRa, we're starting to develop a, a LoRa tracker. I just got some of these modules in from China. Hey, so I need to give you a, a chance to do your own ads during these. <laughs> well, you know, I love working on this stuff, you know, I'm That's always awesome. trying to develop, work. trying to develop new stuff and, you know, and the stuff that I think people will want, you know, but some of it selfishly is projects I wanted to do too. And then it turns out maybe somebody else is interested in it too, you know, so. Definitely going to want to chat with you about LoRa. I, I was an earlier adopter of that. And now it's like finally people in the U.S. are starting to pay attention. So, well, yeah. So my buddy Remy, who um, I've co-designed several products with over the years, he's up in Canada. He's a big lore guy. He loves it. And he's been trying to convince me to play with it for a long time. Well, finally, here recently, we started talking about developing basically a version of our our tracker, our ESP32 tracker that has lore on it instead of a 1200 baud modem. I have one around here somewhere. Anyways, 
So I just got a couple of these modules, the e-byte modules, and um, starting to lay out a board for them now. So I think we're gonna have a LoRa version of the tracker as well as a, a 1200 baud AFSK version. But um, do you know what Semtech chip that that module uses? Uh, that's a good question. I know I knew you were gonna ask that because I remember reading about the different versions. Uh, uh that's just a serial number. Uh, give me a minute and I will pull up the data sheet, which is all in Chinese. Because they hide and, a lot uh, of stuff in those metal uh, shields for a reason. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll look up, uh, I'll look up that data sheet in there in a second. I might be able to tell you which one they put in it. Oh, here's what I was looking for, Richard. I think I've shown this to already several times i actually just did a presentation on this at tapper bcc last month but this is the the tracker the esp32 tracker we're developing the only thing it doesn't have is a vhf transceiver so you add that through the you know the standard mini din but yeah. it's got gps and everything it was we're looking at doing the lower version of this it'll be a little bit bigger because this module's so much bigger but basically you know side by side but uh give me a second i'll pull i think i still have that data sheet Jason, you don't mean to mind if we go into the oh yeah yeah no i'm sorry I, I was just i got sidetracked sorry <laughs> yeah, no worry. so i know we got a few people rolling in i'm sure we'll have a few people who come in a little bit late so no worries um, hey, i'm gonna just make a quick uh public service announcement ron nice year Hey, uh, I'm gonna. I'm at National Night out here in Stafford County, Virginia. So it's too noisy. So I'm going to just uh, recording. But I uh, uh, appreciate you setting these things up. Yeah, no worries. No worries. Thanks for joining. Your ears look good and clean. No Q-tips needed. <laughs> um, I'm just going to start off with just like a brief little public service announcement. So my wife and I got some. Really bad news yesterday. Um, my brother-in-law, he's 42, uh, committed suicide over the weekend. So um, we weren't super close. Very sorry to hear that. Thank you. Yeah, we weren't super close, uh, but you know, I, my my wife is uh, one of three, the oldest of three, and he was the youngest of the three of them. Um, worst part is, is you know, he, he has a, had a 12-year-old son who you know now gets to grow up without a dad um so um all i just say is if you guys know of anyone or you know you ever feel like you're in a, a bad place um there's a suicide crisis hotline you just dial 988 and um you know i mean may, may feel like it's kind of silly to talk to a stranger but Sometimes when you're in a bad place and you need somebody who can be objective and who can listen to you without any sort of bias. So a stranger is actually one of the best people to get help from. So, um, you know, if you don't remember it, just write it down, whatever, but 988, that's all you have to dial. And 24-7, uh, 365, there's someone around to help. So I mean to start on a on a downer, but um, if I just seem a little out of it, that's that's why. So I'm not even going to really go into anything. I'm just going to I'm just going to introduce our speaker, Steve Bossert, who, um, you know, kindly uh, volunteered to speak uh, to the group a couple of I think about three or four months ago, and then had a couple of work related matters that came up, and unfortunately wasn't able to make them make the uh, couple of times, and then. Last month, he's actually the reason why we had the excellent speaker that we did because uh, it was at Steve's recommendation. So that that actually ended up being a really great presentation. Um, I don't think any of us really had any idea what it was going to turn into, but it really evolved into a very lively conversation. I'm hoping tonight will um, be very similar in nature because um, uh, you know Steve's got a lot of years of experience and uh, a lot of field operating experience and. He shared his slides, but I intentionally didn't look over them because I just wanted to kind of be uh, uh, go through them the first time with him. So 
Um, I'm just going to, Steve, as long as you're okay with it, I'm just going to uh, turn it over to you and I'm going to go on mute. But if you need me for anything, let me know. Um, keep it open and you guys can use the chat to do uh, any sort of like raise your hand Q&A stuff. And otherwise, uh, we'll keep it open and uh, over to Mr. Bosser to take over. All right, Jeff. And first, you know, sorry for your loss. That's a, a tough thing to uh, to deal with. So thank you. My condolences. Um, so, all right, let me do a screen share. And yes, as uh, as Jeff had said, I think it was three months ago I was going to give a presentation. Then I had a work thing come up. Then I was supposed to do it last month, and another work thing came up. My my company just seems to love to schedule things that conflict with my hobby. So, you know, shame on them for that. Um, but I was able to get Jonathan uh, Casey two BMW, a good friend of mine, to uh, give the presentation, which I haven't actually seen. So. Uh, I've heard good things about it. So anyway, um, you're a tough audience. Uh, many of you I know. I think I saw you, Don, at Ham Exposition, but like only for a split second, but we didn't get a chance to say hello to each other. So um, maybe I'll see some of you at uh, Nearfest uh, this coming weekend for those uh, in the Northeast. So um, I wanted to try to put together something a little different that blends together a number of different field things, and then something maybe that people don't focus on, um, because I don't want to have like a carbon copy repeat of what um, of Jonathan did last month. So I threw this together. Being ready, the radio amateur guide to sustainable and low impact field operations. What does that mean? So what do I mean by sustainable? We're all a bunch of cheap people. We love to repurpose items for other uses. This is a thumbs up, thumbs down. We've all probably been there. Don't use wire ties when you're doing things in the field. When you want to cut that unused piece and it has a habit, especially the black ones, they get lost in the shuffle. You don't want to be that guy who left a whole bunch of wire ties behind. So how do you avoid that? I've started to use these, uh, these Velcro replaceable strips. They seem to be more prevalent these days than in the past. They come in all sorts of colors and lengths. They are great. Uh, I don't know if anyone's using these or not. You'll see this featured throughout my presentation. Please don't think that this is like a, <laughs> a presentation to make you buy these ties. I don't have any vested interests in the companies that make these, but they're really good. And so I like to try to really promote sustainability uh, instead of waste. So here's just kind of a good example of that. So onwards and upwards. Uh, what do I mean by low impact? Have you ever done an amateur radio public service event? Have you ever wanted to do parks on the air, summits on the air? Don't rely upon a tree to hold up an antenna that could be taking like a three element two meter beam uh, to do APRS with or an HF antenna. I try to not depend on trees. Even for when I go camping, I try to not depend on trees. I like to bring my own portable tree. So fiberglass masts are really a must have necessity. So low impact. Uh, you don't want to get yelled at by like a park ranger or some member of the public by throwing a wire up into a tree and knocking out a branch. So I really like these. There's one company in particular, Jack Height. Um, they just got their stock replenished for like the first time since COVID. Pretty good prices, really high quality. Um, they come in like high visibility orange, which is pretty good. They have 31 foot down to like 20 foot. So if anyone's looking for one of those, um, those are good. So again, low impact, try to be kind to the environment. I think that's the, the kind of the two major takeaways that I want to kind of instill with, you know, how to kind of plan for the field. You don't want to just grab duct tape and zip ties and think you can conquer the world. So those are the first two bits. Uh, so let's maybe shift gears and say, let's put it all together. How do we do different events? Parks on the air near the Appalachian Trail. This was me this just y yesterday, actually. <laughs> at uh, one of the local um, parks on the air locations. Um, you could see the uh, fiberglass mast over there secured to the fence railing. I use those reusable wire ties in many different ways. Um, I also used APRS as a great tool for spotting. Uh, this was kind of a weird activation for me. Um, I had intended to do a summits on the air. Uh, different things happened that wouldn't allow me to get to the site that I wanted. So I took a quick detour to the closest uh, unactivated park and, and did that. Left zero traces behind, although I can't say the same for some people that were there before me with 
beer bottles and whatever other crap that they left behind. But, you know, try to keep a low impact on the environment, especially when we think about the Appalachian Trail. That's kind of like the grandfather of leave no trace. And so I, I really like to try to practice that where possible. Um, in this case, I uh, played on 17 meters to activate this particular parks on the air, which was good fun. And I didn't have cell phone service, but rarely, which is the which is not normally the norm for me here in New York, if there's APRS coverage, the cell phone coverage, if there's no cell phone coverage, there's no APRS coverage, but in this spot, there was really good APRS coverage. And so I was hitting a bunch of different digipeters and I was able to uh, take my Kenwood uh, THD 74 and uh, ping out what frequency on HF I was on. And then people were picking that up on uh, APRS phi and then going through the normal spots. So uh, this way people can find me. So um, that was a pretty great way to, uh, to blend the HF and the APRS uh, side of things. Here was two weeks ago of a combination parks on the air and summits on the air. This was part of the Appalachian Trail on the air event. Sounds like I do a lot of stuff with the AT, especially given this group, right? So uh, this was the AT on the air that Mike uh, WB2 FUV, who's was like super number one soda guy, like on the planet, or at least I like to think of him as he put that together a couple of years ago, uh, the first weekend of October. So we're not the only uh, Appalachian Trail event out there, the AT on the air, uh, AT on the air.net is the, uh, the website. Uh, so that's uh, what took place. A couple things that I like to highlight, again, if you're going out and you need to be prepared and ready, and especially if you're going not in a car and you're on your foot, uh, I like to kind of talk about the three Ps, power, performance, and packability. Power meaning how do you power your different gadgets if we're talking about radio, but also how do you power yourself as a human, water, food, comfort, so, you know, power is kind of generic, but uh, I like to highlight that performance. Every little thing that you have in your backpack or on your body, you have to extract ma maximum performance. You don't have weight and space to waste on experiments. So think about the performance. What are you going to get out of different devices? Myself recently, I've switched over to an iPad mini uh, for when I want to do logging and some digital mode stuff. Uh, it took some some shakedown to make sure that it was going to be field ready, but it's been far uh, a pretty good tool. The only thing that I don't like about an iPad mini compared to all my other stuff is it has the Apple stupid plug. So now I have to carry an extra wire, which I'm not too much of a fan of, but that I think outweighed the annoyances, but, you know, performance, I, I think I wanted to go with that and packability. You know, if anyone's held an iPad mini, they know it's a small device. Uh, you know, like the radio that I have pictured underneath the, uh, the uh, Yesu 817, pretty small. Uh, that's a Yesu, uh, no, it's an Alinko DJ G5 uh, DMR slash APRS radio. So, you know, they take up a lot less space, especially if you're going to be on your, your feet. Uh, you want to pack your bag correctly. So you can see that chart over. That's the appropriate way to pack a bag. Uh, you want to put your heavy items up top and your lightweight stuff towards like the bottom. Uh, your back will thank you if you're going to go out maybe next year for ATGP instead of having to go to a spot that you can get to by car. Uh, I think like Tim up in uh, Katahdin, you know, can't drive a car there. So he probably knows all too well about this type of stuff. So um, you know, I like to kind of really think about that. Um, I try not to, when I go out on the trail, I don't make that like the first time to experiment with stuff. I'm probably tinkering to my neighbor's weirdness and all sorts of contraptions in my backyard because I want to do a shakedown before I go and take stuff out of the field. It could be like a tent, a tarp, a shelter, some kind of an antenna project, whatever. Uh, so if you're going to go out and play something in the field, be ready. Don't wait to the event itself to play with something and learn from your mistakes. Bring only what 100% works. And generally, if I'm going out into the field, I try to plan for two times the amount of field time. So that could be two times the amount of water, two times the amount of power, 
two times the amount of anything because you never know if you get stuck somewhere you want to be able to be comfortable don't try to scrimp on the water weight you can always pour it out when you're on the way back to the trail uh back to the car so um that's that and then that's myself in the uh the blue pack you can see how self-contained i am uh then that's my friend chris kd2ydn who's new into the hobby about a year but he's been making fantastic strides and all sorts of cool things so if you catch him on a summit or on aprs or any of these other things be sure to say hi he's a he's a great guy um and he's also a vet uh, so he's a handy guy to have he's a vet and an emt so <laughs> i know he has certain things covered that i don't so uh that's how i would approach like you know playing stuff on the at by foot compared to car here's an actual shot of uh my uh deployment for this past H atgp that was my first time i've known of the event never really lived close to it it always seemed like there were people willing to step up but uh this year was the first time i was able to participate uh, ended up at sam's point i was expecting to backpack because i've been to sam's point before and then a few days beforehand uh the, the prior uh gentleman who has done that site for a couple of years um i think it was jeff probably connected us or or, or john tarbox i forget one one of you two guys but uh you connected me with him uh we connected and then he told me the secret secret gate code the secret handshake how to you know drive vehicle up there whatever and so that actually made things a little weird for me i planned to go totally ultralight and then i had to rethink my plan usually it's the opposite way usually you're planning to go someplace like heavy duty and then you have to scale down in my case i had to figure out how to scale up so you know through a folding table and the rest of some other stuff and some higher power gear in the car and kind of made it a last uh, a last bit so um use the artificial tree uh what you can see in the photo is a much heavier tripod i would not take that on a backpack usually it's just a fiberglass pole um but i figured hey why not i have the car with me it gives me an extra nine feet of uh, of height so uh that's that um you can see some other gadgets i'll i'll chat about but for those that were part of uh, ATGP, which I know there's many of you on here that were, what I was using at uh, Sam's Point was a two meter uh, ladder line J-pole on top of the 20 foot fiberglass mast on top of the uh, black tripod that you see. And I was feeding that with a Kenwood D74 HD as my primary radio. With five watts, I was able to make contact with where I needed to. Obviously, height was of... Uh, of help, but you know, I didn't really need much more. I didn't need to go overly complicated. I try to keep things pretty simple. I had an arrow beam if, if needed for one way directional comms, but you know, for the most part, I, I didn't need to do that. Uh, my power for the entire event, um, both before and after, uh, especially the after part, because it was a VHF contest, I played uh, six meters, uh, but I ran everything off of a 12 hour amp hour battery, uh, a DIY kit that I bought off of. Uh, eBay a couple of years ago. Now you can buy those batteries like super cheap. But, you know, even though I had the vehicle and extra stuff, I still wanted to stay true to my original plan. So I ran everything off of a 12 amp hour battery. Anyone who has the Kenwood D74 knows the battery life is horrible. Um, so I just plugged that right into my lithium uh, battery uh, with a set of power poles. And uh, that worked out fine. I also had a splitter that I connected a uh, Yesu 8972, which I converted into a self-contained digipeter, um, and that worked out well. And uh, yeah, everything was pretty pretty easy. So again, for for me as a first time with uh, ATGP, I thought it went well. Clearly, I would not take the stuff in a backpack, but hey, you know, if you have the means, take advantage. Uh, here are some things that I thought I'd just kind of highlight quickly. What are some things if you're going to be in the field? How do you mount stuff? that doesn't take up a lot of space and that they're cheap. I like these Tiki Torch spike mounts. You can go to like Walmart or Target and buy these for like five or six bucks. You can go on Amazon. I think they have like a four pack for like 10 or $11. It's a metal stake, has a, uh, a hole. If you took a piece of um, one inch PVC, it slides perfectly right inside of it. Um, makes it really great. You could throw that in a backpack. You could slide a piece of fiberglass mast over it um takes up little space little weight uh if you have ground that you can actually jam something into it's perfect for that um 
The uh, 12 inch tent stakes, I discovered those at a Walmart a couple of years ago. It's kind of a goofy thing. They're like two bucks a piece. They're plastic, they're durable. What I like about these, and there's lots of different stakes, the threads on the bottom have really wide surface area. And so if you have very shallow soil and you don't wanna leave like a big hole, uh, you just screw these right in. You only need to go like three or four inches and they're super, super sturdy. If anyone was at uh, Nearfest in May, everyone knows it got a little windy. I had those stakes in the ground um, by the, uh, the setup that we use as kind of the, the pre-prep for ATGP. And uh, those things were not going anywhere. So really great. They don't weigh much, you know, definitely add them to your, your kits. You never know when you're going to need something to, to anchor something to. Um, and then lastly, you got these, these, these tension clips. It's like a, like a clip, like a, like a carabiner, but you slip a piece of rope through it and you pull it and it just self locks over it. If you don't want to mess around with knots, I feel like knots don't take up any weight, but these are handy if you need to tension off a rope like really quick and sturdy and be able to just clip it on and off. Those I think are really cool to have. And then uh, let's see, uh, talking about some radio stuff. So uh, mentioned the Kenwood uh, D74, as you all know, it's not made anymore. It's too bad. Hopefully Kenwood fixes their factories up and puts a new radio out. I don't need to get into the details, but um, use that for the entire ATGP on the 1200 baud, worked good. Didn't work as good as I expected on 9600 baud. I haven't really been able to convince too many of my local enthusiasts here to experiment with 9600 baud other than like testing it from one end of a room to another. So that was definitely learned that uh, that radio for whatever it's worth, didn't do 9600 baud to my nearest sites for ATGP this year, which I was kind of bummed about, but otherwise for close, it worked fine. Um, so that's that. On the other side of the screen is a radio that's less common. I think I was probably one of the first people to grab one of these after learning about it and do some detailed reviews. I know some people have not been a fan of it. There's been some quality control issues. Uh, I have two of them. Both of them seem to work, but I know some other folks uh, have had some bad situations here. Um, so I don't know, it's, it's interesting with that particular radio. If you get a good one or a bad one, supposedly they're making a new one. It's a cool piece of gear. It's, you know, 1200 baud only Bluetooth. Uh, I use it for ATGP. I had it paired to my laptop uh, communicating with pinpoint APRS. And uh, it seemed to do the job as like a backup. I had two different uh, radios going. So for me, it's been good. Not for some of us, others, uh, like John, it hasn't been as good. Other people have kind of mixed uh, thoughts in between, but for 165 bucks, you know, it, it's not a, not a bad radio. Um, I don't know if that's on uh, Jason's uh, radar, but I think they're pretty open to working with hardware developers. I introduced them to the M17 folks. So maybe they might lend a hand there, but I don't know. It's, it's still worth, worth a mention for yeah, my attention. Radio. I'm looking it up right now. <laughs> I'm surprised you don't know about it already. We could, we could always chat offline, but I think, uh, I think you're going to like it, but ignore some of the bugs. Um, all right, uh, power, again, not like anything earth shattering here, but it uh, looks like an SLE battery. Uh, everyone probably has some type of a LiPo battery by now. It looks like the, the standard alarm batteries. This was a kit you could buy for, I think, like 15 bucks on eBay. It's basically a shell on a charge controller, and you have to supply your own um, uh, LiPo cells, or you could buy one these days for the same price. But what I like about this setup instead of the bio NO batteries is you only need to have one set of wires. You don't need to have a separate plug for charge and a separate plug for power. You just put your charger on it and it charges. Again, not a big deal, but I try to keep things interoperable. I put all my stuff on power poles and BNC connectors for antennas. And then for power poles, I could just attach different wires and stuff to it. So a splitter to power different radios or a, a wire to plug into the D74 or a USB output to uh, connect other things uh, allows me to free up my uh, my power bank for other items. So it doesn't take up a lot of weight, doesn't take up space too much, but I like it. And hey, look, there's those uh, those uh, those reusable wire wraps. I uh, wrap them around the wire to prevent it from coming loose 
in my pack. And then it also makes a good sturdy spot if you wanted to attach it to somewhere like on a mole uh, strip on your backpack while you're stationary. Uh, they come in handy for that. So really like those batteries quite well, have a couple. And uh, let's see, just random stuff here for the event. Please nobody shoot me. I know some of you are very pressure, preferential to the APRS ISCE software for obvious reasons. Uh, I like pinpoint APRS, please don't shoot me. I'm gonna have to figure something else out for now using an iPad in the field, but I like pinpoint. That's what the screen grab is from, uh, from ATGP. Uh, you could see, here's me over here at Sam's point, and then here's everywhere in the chain that was uh, actively received by me. So I think that, I think it worked out pretty good. And I know this is a tough audience. And so I wanted to keep this short and inspire conversation and see where things go. So that's it. Thank you. And uh, please hold those tomatoes and rocks. If you have any questions, throw them at me, but do so gently. Yeah, uh, Steve, I was going to ask about what you use to power your 817. And over in the chat, uh, apparently the bi BioNO battery is getting strong recommendations over there. Yes. Yeah, so, um, Currently, I actually use an ICOM 705, and I use that this battery that we have that I have on the screen share. When I had a Yisu 817, which I had on a picture earlier, yeah, that's right there. You see this right here. So that was a, a thing that I quasi modified. If you go on, what I probably buy that probably on Amazon. It was like a light a lipo pack. With like an on-off switch and just like a, you know, a 2.5 millimeter DC jack on it. That was like before bio I know was like more commonly available and lipo packs came down in cost. These days, I feel like you can buy any lipo battery like super cheap. I think the reason why I had that one at the time was because I couldn't find anything that put out 13.8 volts. A lot of mm. them kind of went out at 12 and that's, right. that one actually put out the higher voltage. Same thing with the um, with this guy. You know, it'll it'll pretty much stay at like 13, 1, 13, 2. And some devices you need to have more than 12 and a half volts. If it goes below that, you don't have any appreciable benefits. So, you know, I know that other one looked kind of cooler, but <laughs> I'll, I'll look at my Amazon if you want. I'll shoot you the link. I don't even know if they still make it, but it was cool because it had a power on off switch and it was. Tiny. I think it put out, I think it was like 6,000 milliamps, if I remember. Um, and that was plenty for like an 817. Now I use that that larger battery with a, uh, a 705 and it works. So uh, I've, I've yet to really kill it. It takes takes a long time to, to really deplete it. I can't believe that mine was the only question. I like those poles, by the way. That's a good idea. I've, I've been out and trying to find a place to elevate an antenna is kind of tough sometimes. No doubt. So Steve, I, I know that like um, given the, the presentation, um, you know, that you, we had talked about some other stuff to chat about. I mean, I, I wouldn't, uh, I mean, you don't have to, but I was just curious as to like some of your feedback, seeing as how you're a relative newcomer to Golden Packet, um, you know what your what your experience was like, and um, you know if you had, if you noticed anything that you would like to see in the future. I mean, and and this, like I said, this is kind of more to stimulate conversation, not necessarily put you on the spot. But for anyone who's like newer to Golden Packet yourself or anyone else. Um, you know, yeah, kind of like so, any words of wisdom or things that made things challenging, things that could have been done better. So I think as an event, I think it was run very well, you know, for, for me as an individual contributor, you know, it was getting where I needed to get to by the predetermined time that was like within my control. That was no issue. Um, could I have run probably higher power? I don't think it would have really mattered because I was able to reach, you know, my next and my next, next station uh, beyond me. So I don't think that really mattered. I wish that I had more 
experience with other people at further distance to experiment with 9600 baud. I know there's been some other group conversations on that. Um, that's something that I wanted to really try to get more time behind and trying to convince people to spend money or to get the right devices configured to play with 9600 baud. Mm -hmm. That's probably something that could have been done better. I know Don built, you know, gave us all these fantastic uh, things um, for the APRS client, which generally worked pretty good. Um, but I think we all struggle with the same thing. There's like not a off the shelf piece of hardware, or even if we all calibrate things to work with our own stuff, the levels were just so tight. You know, yeah. I think that that was probably the biggest thing. Um, I wouldn't say it as like a negative. I think that was just a learning experience for probably everybody. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I would say about 9,600. I think something that I think would be interesting not to make a complicated event more complicated because like we're dealing with weather, we're dealing with like 2,500 miles, right? Like there's just a lot of complexities uh, with stuff. I think what was kind of neat when I did the AT on the air event uh, early part of this month was maybe if there was a way we could try to incorporate parks on the air because the AT technically is a park. It's K4556. Mm -hmm. I think what I would probably say was we all knew what was going on with ATGP. It's a small group, but nobody else really knew. There, there was one friend of mine, uh, KD2TAQ, some of you may have remember seeing him pop up at, uh, at High Point in New Jersey. He knew about the event because I told him about it. And he's like super into APRS. He actually doesn't even want to talk on the radio. He just wants to do digital stuff. Mm -hmm. That's fine by me. He didn't really know how he could be part of the event. So if there was a better way for us to create a backbone and allow people to kind of hit our secret frequency and ping packets back and forth, that I think would be the ultimate. And if I think about like, you know, Bob Reninga, right, you know, it's great as an infrastructure, but how do we kind of enable this? So mm -hmm. how can we blend those two things? That's what I would probably say to spur the conversation, not to make it more complicated, because I think as a group, it was really great. But how do we kind of promote this to like a wider audience? Yeah, it's kind audience. of like a yeah, it's kind of like a, a dual edged sword to an extent, right? Because part of the part of the attraction to the event is just the fact that you've got what, 2,200 miles and you can uh, when we've been successful, right? You, 15 stations along a 2200 mile path can be successful. So if you start adding other stations in between, then it sort of dilutes the uh, kind of like the, the distance, the proof of concept of the distance aspect of it. And, you know, having multiple operators at a single site kind of to an extent complicates things. So I think that's, um, something I've been just thinking about just the past couple of years is I would love to expand the event. Um, you know, but the, the distance thing is, I, I think as part of the appeal to it at the same time, it works against us. Um, we also run into some technical challenge just in terms of like hop counts and the number of stations that we can support with the current hop count. We've talked about adapting it to add in other stations on either end of the trail. Um, these are all good ideas, though, because I, I, I liked the idea that Lynn had um, for this year when we were first talking about the appliance was, um, you know, having the stations that are already uh, on the that are already part of the event, but then having some kind of like adjacent stations that could beacon packets uh, like, you know, out in either direction, kind of like east, west versus north, south. Um, I don't know. That's why I was thinking about the POTA side, like with the AT on the air event, I want to say for that 24 hours, I don't think there were more than like 15 POTA guys or stations that were out on K4556 for, the, for that duration of the event. Mm -hmm. Some of them I know were at weird spots where like they couldn't spot, like they couldn't, you know, connect over a cellular network and they couldn't, you know, spot where they were, what band, what frequency, whatever. But I feel like if, if we were able to combine people from both camps, like we can help them, right? Because, you know, we can bounce things back and forth and spot, you know, somewhere along our chain, somebody has internet. Um, and then they have like this wider scale. So people might even, 
you know, pick up on what we're doing. So I don't know, just for what it's worth, but yeah, don't want to make it too much more complicated. That's probably the biggest takeaway is don't, don't try to do more than what we shouldn't do. Cause yeah, I mean, I think kind of like AC on the air, I mean, we could probably, they, they did a really good job of like marketing the event to an extent, right. Is, is that there, I think there are a lot more people who are aware of it than golden pack, even though they started after us. Um, I feel like they kind of copied our idea, but okay, no, yeah. whatever. We, um, we had we had better t-shirts though. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, so, uh, but you know, in any event, I think that, um, I don't know, like something I'm just, I just thought of, right, is what Bob had this vision of having like this backbone. I mean, what about adapting Golden Packet to make it more of like a proof of concept of the backbone, whereas opposed to standalone backbone stations, right, that we put people out on the trail to operate them more manually initially and then have people out along the trail that test to see if the backbone works Sim simulated emergency exercise i don't know just an idea i think we have the brain power on this call to make that happen so no pressure for those that are tuned in huh? Jason clearly has enough uh, hardware to to go around. We know where to get it, and we know uh, we know who yeah. the master of softwares are. Given John and Don and some others on here, so we could definitely pull it off. I think. Yeah, and other. I mean, anyone else? Feel free to you know jump in, share. We just kind of opened it up. I have fifteen watts next year. You're moving up. Yeah, I bought an Icom two hundred eight H. Uh, at a ham fest, uh, John was with me. And uh, so we figured out that with a uh, six amp hour battery, we'll be able to do 15 watts on Katahdin this year. Uh, I do want to share one thing. Uh, it's probably completely not related actually to any of this talk today. Uh, but uh, John has significant um, RF issues up on Washington. Uh, I went up there. Uh, about a month ago, I was doing a soda and um, I'm up on the summit and I'm trying to make contacts and I hear uh, I hear a repeater. I have a HT and I'm, I got a repeater on the second band and I hear these guys saying that they can't they can they can hear me, but he can't hear us. And um, <laughs> so uh, somehow I just got in contact on the repeater and someone said hey walk over to this spot on mount washington maybe a quarter mile uh eighth of a mile whatever where i from where i was everybody was full quieting on simplex after that i couldn't hear anybody contacting me uh that's just one thing i want to throw out there i know i don't attend these calls too often um but i'll see john and don and a few other folks at near fest this weekend um but I just wanted to get that out there that I think that might be part of our issue for Katahdin going to Washington is the amount of RF that John has to deal with up there. Uh, he probably doesn't hear me. That's pretty much it. I'm glad that you bring that up. I actually, I forgot to include that. I had the same issue at Sam's point. There's so much commercial stuff right there. I was getting all sorts of wacky bleed through on UHF. Having some simple bandpass filters I think would be a huge bonus. I know like the, the, uh, the soda folks in the UK, like this, you know, like they have like their so the soda beam guys, they have like a little two meter band pass filter, you know, adopting something like that would be great. I've had good luck on HF doing soda with having some, uh, 17, 20 and 40 meter band passes makes a huge difference, even though you don't think that anything else is interfering with you down that low, but it makes a huge difference. Yeah, I know there's some attenuation with them. So I'm going to try to work with John to see if I can get him uh, an antenna that has a little bit more gain. Uh, maybe just a, what you showed us earlier, the um, the J-Pole. He might have one of those. I don't know if, John, if you're on this call. Um, but anyway, if we can get him a little bit more gain, and now I got 15 watts and get him a uh, bandpass filter, I think we might be in business over there. I know he can get Equinox, no problem, from uh, Washington. So anyway, Jeff, I know you might be wondering too. I feel like two years in a row, I couldn't, I could hear that's funny because I heard John's voice uh, loud and clear, you know, S7 from uh, Washington, but he couldn't hear me. 
Huh. And it was funny that a month later I hiked up there and I had the exact same problem. So I think uh, Stone Mountain, Jeff, you were saying was a similar deal. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so I'm um, actually just put the link in the uh, in the chat. So Van Pass Filter, I bought one of these. I was I meant to use it this year. And I don't know, just with coordinating and all the other moving parts I was trying to track in my head. I, I didn't even think to take it out of my kit. But um, yeah, I mean, a, a band pass filter, right? Bob had even said, right, that like a helical band pass filter was an absolute must at Stone Mountain. Um, you know, Dave, who is supposed to activate that site, he brought an HT out with him the day that we went to go scope the site out. And, um, and granted, it was like a, it was a bow thing, but we could get traffic out of there uh, on UHF, but VHF, not a chance. And you can argue that the bow thing just has horrible filtering, um, but I think using a bandpass filter couldn't have hurt, right? So... Yeah, and this one, this one in particular has a lower uh, insertion loss than the some of the ones I've seen on eBay. Of course, it's a lot more expensive, but uh, that one looks pretty good. John is using a I Kenwood, uh, I think D seven ten. So he just uses the Baofeng, I think, for for voice comms on UHF. But um, anyway, yeah, uh, we're gonna have a chat. Uh, I think there's a number of us uh, that'll be at Nearfest, at least three or four of us uh, this weekend. So uh, we're going to do kind of a, I, I think, a Don, are you going to be there too? Yeah, I plan to be there Saturday. Okay. Where is it? In New Hampshire? Yeah, it's in Deerfield, New Hampshire. It's uh, pretty close to Manchester, our okay. biggest city. Wish I was closer. I would join you guys. Oh, it's a hoot. It's very well attended. I think we get about 2,000 or 1,500 people, something like that. Some years it's pretty bad, but uh, if the weather's good, they all show up. <laughs> if you really want to experience something, trying to fall asleep to Inagata de Vida by Iron Butterfly at 3 o'clock in the morning when they're going through there. <laughs> that's that's even more fun time. <laughs> Uh, you're just a little hop, skip, and a jump 11 hours from me, so I don't think I'm going to be making the trip from Virginia, but uh, <laughs> sounds like fun, though. Well, guys, I know in the past we've kind of, I don't want to necessarily uh, uh, force everyone to stay longer than, than needed, but um, I mean, if anybody has any questions or comments they want to share, um, otherwise we can kind of break a little earlier than usual which would help make up for the times where you've stayed far later than usual and kind of cancel each other out a little bit i just wanted to say that um uh first of all very interesting steve so thank you for uh for the presentation i i found it very interesting um uh so an interesting side note was uh the very same weekend that we did um appalachian our our project um a group of four guys from my local club here decided to do this kind of bonehead thing that they didn't plan real well. They hiked into the mountains uh, not far from where I was in Virginia. Uh, they went. They basically camped. They they climbed into uh, the woods with uh, with as much stuff as they carry on their backs, tents, the whole deal, and they decided they were just going to operate from you know battery right there in the middle of the woods and. Uh, and uh, they had a little success. They had some disasters too, and it was kind of interesting because they. It was just odd how they randomly selected that very same weekend that we were doing that. And I even raised my hand and I said, "Oh, you probably don't know this, but we're doing the Appalachian Golden, you know, Golden Packet uh, that same weekend." And they didn't know what it was, you know. So of course, I gave them a quick little, you know, two minute explanation. And um, they were going to try to do some packing and win link and stuff like that. Now, one thing that they did, the, the what I call is the uh, the rabbit in the hat, was they had a fifth guy who um, drove to the top of one of the closest mountains to them. And he was to be like their relay station from the valley where they were at. And hmm. um, he was able to do a little bit of like win link and some other stuff to help them out with this project. Now, 
I don't necessarily understand what their complete goal was with because I don't think they ever really explained that to anyone. Uh, but they, they had fun doing it. They, they've actually, uh, they're just crazy enough that they've, they've recruited about another like four or five guys for the next trip. <laughs> so anyways, I just, I found it interesting, you know, kind of drawing the parallels between what Steve just presented. You're talking about the Appalachian trail, what they did and what we do, you know? So anyways, it's just more of an anecdotal, you know, thing that I just wanted to throw in there as a comment, you know, isn't necessarily directly related, but I, I, you know, it's interesting the guys that are getting into this stuff that decide they want to just kind of go off the grid and see what they can achieve. So, I mean, hats off to them, honestly. I love the camp, but I don't know if I'd like to camp that way. <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah, it goes without saying. Tim Tim's got the most hardcore experience out of out of all of us. Yeah, it might be you too, Jeff. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, next year I'm coming with you. So, okay, good. That'll be fun. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. We just got to find somebody to cover down here at Springer. That shouldn't be too hard, though. Steve, thank you uh, yeah, so yeah. much for presenting tonight. Really appreciate it. And I, I, uh, I knew you know, this would be a tough audience, so thanks for uh, no, no, no. We're all a bunch of teddy bears. So no, we're gentle. <laughs> we're gentle. We're all gentle. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of um, good knowledge in one one room, but that, you know that's a uh, that's a good thing. Some of us are set in our ways, though. So. Yeah, <laughs> I'm I'm including myself in that group. <laughs> the, the best thing is the distrib the distribution of various parts of the knowledge, like what to pack, how much water to pack, and the the two times what you should what you think you need that you might need. Um, so it's great how we all synergistically make the whole thing happen. So I appreciate your presentation tonight, Steve. Good job. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Steve. Yeah, thank you, Steve. And real quick, I was going to say that that radio you suggested, I had seen that. When, as soon as I pulled it up, I was like, oh, I saw this, but I thought it was vaporware. I didn't think it actually existed. So I just bought one. I bought the last one on eBay for 150 bucks. so we'll find out. <laughs> so, well, if you have questions, feel free to ping me. If, once, you, once you start to do searches for whatever, okay. chances are you're probably going to come across some article or some reference to an article that I wrote. So Okay, cool. All right. Good deal. Well, I, I was just kind of excited to see it actually had a decode option, which, uh, you know, other than the any tone, uh, that's the only other thing that I'm aware of that, that does that. Um, yeah, so, uh, the, so, so here's the neat thing with this. It's, it's, it's like a Frankenstein radio. There's two different CPSs. If you've ever had one of those AVRT trackers, it's like the same firmware to oh, program right. that. And uh -huh. then if you've ever had a Baofeng, uh -huh. It's like the same firmware for that. So you have two different softwares and two different bootloaders uh, uh -huh. with how it is. But the, yeah. the APRS side is rather interesting. It has a 1200 board hardware modem. So it's not uh -huh. emulated in software like the Anytone is. It's an actual hardware modem basically connected through the MCU. So for some of the stuff that you're playing with, if you get brazen enough to open up the inside of the radio, or you'll find enough pictures of the insides that i've done you'll see like oh okay it's an stm 32 okay you'll see exactly what they're doing um oh, okay the rumor however is that the vendor uh behind this they're rumored to be coming out with a new radio that has a common mcu that shares both functions but they continue to have supply chain issues as you could probably imagine yeah uh if you're in china and you want to build stuff around Silicon Labs stuff, you can't find Silicon Labs stuff in China. So they had to go low budget and go with Broadcom. And when they say oh. low budget Broadcom, they had to go with knockoff Broadcom. So <laughs> I mean, the, the, he, he's a smart guy. He knows, he knows what he's doing. They have some cool stuff at the company who's like their major reseller. I would have probably told you to have not bought it on eBay. You could have oh, really? bought it directly. You could probably cancel it. If you buy it directly from Venus iTech, They'll have it that was the door. first website they came yeah. up actually the, yeah e e even though they're in uh in asia 
they DHL it. You know, next time you talk to John Tarbox, he'd tell you he had it in less than a week. Like they're really quick on the turnaround. And then and, and you'll get better support because if you buy it out of channel, he'll basically tell you, sorry, you bought it from somewhere else. And I can't. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. I, uh, hmm. Let's see. I wonder if I can cancel this. They've actually already emailed me on eBay and said, thank you for the purchase. We're sending this out as soon as possible. And I'm like, oh my God, I've never, I've never gotten that kind of service out of an eBay seller overseas. <laughs> um, okay. It's, it's a right. fun radio. You, you, you can't send messages with yeah. it as a handheld. You can't do like QWERTY on it, but you pair it to your smartphone with APRS Droid and it works fine. However, oh. That's However, cool. I didn't realize you yeah, could do that. It, okay. It, it, it's really, it's really cool. Like it'll function as a Bluetooth GPS. It, it's, it's like for 150 bucks. There's a lot of cool tech that they jammed in there. However, there's been some batches where to trick certain features in the MCU, like they bridged a couple of the pins, and some people complain that like Bluetooth serial doesn't work, whereas other people with different serial numbers do work. So I hope you don't get a bum version of it. And, and yeah i guess i'm i'm anytime you buy anything like this on ebay um you know you run that risk so i guess uh, i guess i'm gonna find out um okay well you know we're friends on facebook so i i may eventually shoot you a message and we'll have to chat maybe about this a little more the one thing i was going to tell everybody is if anyone does have the any tone the eight the eight, was it the 858 uv2 plus the the one that you know the latest and greatest so I have one and I played with it for about a month and it worked okay. Decode was kind of marginal. Tr Transmit seemed to be all right. And then about a week ago, two weeks ago, I got word that they had an updated firmware version for the, uh, the because there's a separate Bluetooth modem board, I guess, that they added inside that radio. Mm -hmm. So I upgraded the firmware on it. Uh, this was last uh, two Fridays ago. I upgraded that morning turned it back on, set it in my windowsill at my office, and it seemed to be decoding way better. It seemed hmm. to be doing a really good job. And I thought, cool. And I even heard it, you know, beep, beep. I hear it, you know, periodically. After about three hours, I noticed I wasn't hearing anything anymore. And I thought, oh, the battery must have died. And I looked up, no, nope, sure enough, the radio's still on. So I turn it off, turn it back on. Nothing seems to be working, won't transmit APR, nothing. Well, I happened to notice in the menu that the APRS menus and the Bluetooth menus were missing. So I contacted Bridgecom and they asked me specifically, they said, are the Bluetooth menus missing? And I said, yeah. And they went, yeah, we've seen where some of these have gone bad. And when you turn the radio on, if the, ra if the main processor can't see that board, it automatically removes those menu options. So sure enough, so I sent it back for our warranty repair. They actually ended up sending me a whole brand new radio. They told me not to send anything but just the radio. They told me to keep the battery, everything. They ended up sending me a brand new radio in the box. So now I have double batteries, double charger, everything. Mm -hmm. I even said, do you want me to send this stuff back? And they said, no, just keep it. They said, uh, you know, we determined it was a bad radio. Just keep everything. So I got double accessories now for it, but... I've been playing with it and it seems to be working. I hope it's not a sign of something that's going to happen again with it, though. You know, my well, there is an option um, in the CPS that you can go into and you can enable or disable Bluetooth and APRS. So I'm wondering if it maybe got reverted back to off. So interesting thing about that was when it when it bombed down, I noticed that wasn't working. I reloaded the firmware and it said it accepted the firmware, but nothing would uh nothing would re-enable like I, and i know what you're talking about because i was in there poking around every option trying to figure out maybe it was something i did wrong mm -hmm. and and everything was enabled and uh in bridgecom they kind of confirmed they're like yeah we've seen this not it's a wide known issue it's just we've seen this and when they got the radio back they didn't waste any time like literally they had the radio 24 hours and they were already sending me a brand new one so i don't know mm -hmm. It's a shame because, uh, like you were talking about with this radio, if the Bluetooth option on that A tone allowed you to link to it to be able to basically use the internal modem, we'll call it a modem, uh, sure would be nice because, you know, even though it doesn't do 96, it, you know, it does 1200 and it sure, sure would be nice to have that option. I just grabbed mine because I just did that firmware update yesterday. Okay. So you so know what, what I'm talking about. No, so I'm just I'm, curious to see I'm, if they disappeared. What I'm curious on is, so with the AnyTone, I, 
with the Bluetooth module, which is really what enables the receive, if that crapped out, was it still able to beacon AX25 packets? Because It was not. It was not no. able to do anything APRS related, okay. packet related. It ever all that died because all those menus actually disappeared out of the menu. Um, it, and they even told me, they said, yeah, we've seen where that board will die mm -hmm. and just, you know, dead, dead. And when you turn the radio on, when it boots and it can't see that board, it can't read it. It just, it automatically removes those functions from the menu. So, so like I said, I got back a brand new radio and as you can see, Bluetooth and, uh, APRS is back in the menu, so, so uh, you know, it's working. I'm still not 100%, like, it's pretty hit or miss. Uh, a lot of times, you know, whether, um, like, the messaging is really wonky on this thing. I can't yes, seem is. to get a lot of stuff to decode the messages. Um, the, the overall APRS configuration in the radio period is wonky. Yeah, you're right. You're right. It, yeah, just like the way it you have to like tell it it's a data channel versus you know I don't know. It's just kind of odd. Um, I, I really wish that this did a better job at displaying whenever it does receive a packet. You know, mm -hmm. showing the information on. I mean, it's all in firmware, and they 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 could fix it if I I guess I guess Lynn was Lynn. Were you kind of actively talking with them at one time about? I was mainly helping them make sure that at least the messaging that they did have implemented was implemented properly. Gotcha. Okay. It, it was not sending out acts. It would not act a uh, a reply act properly, okay. and all sorts of display artifacts like they tended to display dash zero instead of suppressing it yeah I've, I, in some areas i've noticed that i wish they would re uh, uh, remove that like in even the configuration if you want to just run your call with no ssid you still have to put a zero in there and yeah. like you said sometimes they mask that sometimes they show it little things little quirks like that yeah if they were to fix some of those things it would uh the the biggest issue with it is the firmware developer um does not speak English. And for those of <laughs> us that have actually read the APRS 101 PDF spec, um, even if you understand English, it's not yeah. really clear. <laughs> yeah, I know. So I dug through it. <laughs> I was actually quite impressed that it had as much in it as it had. Uh, we had an interface that was the bridge between the language bridge between those of us that were helping alpha and beta test it and tell them what was blatantly wrong instead of just cosmetically wrong mm -hmm. and uh he would relay it over to the actual developers well i'm glad you were at least had a hand in it somehow you know because yeah. i mean um probably we have you the thank single-handedly thank you for uh it, for when when for we what started, we have when we started it would only do messaging to other any tones Oh, <laughs> nothing else would decode the messages. Proprietary messaging. <laughs> but yet they thought it was APRS messaging. <laughs> you sure Motorola didn't make this? <laughs> uh, so That's a it, dig it, on myself there. <laughs> it, it came a long way in what we did with them. Uh, the Bluetooth is not Bluetooth serial port profile. You're not going to get access to the internal TNC functions. Well, okay, from, that answers that question. From, okay, we, we've, That is the number one thing on the list we gave them that if you've got room for it, and mm -hmm. it's the never-ending firmware problem of running out of space, um, that is the number one request from the UK Anytone, um, what do you call them? user group Profit, or whatever yeah profit's not the right world he, he we're he's an evangelist <laughs> oh a, yeah a UK any tone evangelist mm. uh, that is the one that actually got me hooked into it or jeff did that or somebody got me hooked into the whole thing but it, it's a cute uh, little radio yeah I, honestly i could do without the bluetooth interface i mean that would be really cool but if they were to just make the on screen interface a little more d7 ish like maybe maybe that's yeah. the words i'm looking for um i think then it would especially if you could just people like me i i love dmr but i've got my motorola dmr radios honestly i would love to just tell this radio just be an aprs radio don't worry about any other function just yeah. concentrate on aprs and that's the only thing you're here to do in life i would love that they just gave it an aprs only mode that would be sweet i think that would be great 
but yeah. you know but hey, hell talking... hell if, even make an alternate firmware where they don't even support all the dmr just an aprs only firmware then they would have the room to put a whole bunch of new features and yeah. stuff in but... But then we're talking a niche of a niche of a niche yeah exactly <laughs> exactly and 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 being a small time product developer i know niches are what kills you a lot of times yeah that's why i still have a day job <laughs> well anyways that's it's maybe, interesting to know the history maybe we can convince tanner who's the guy behind the pico aprs to come out with a radio that does more than one watt and yeah we have exactly what we need his new one the v4 i don't know if, if anyone follows his stuff a little yeah i follow him oh, on yeah, Twitter. something new Oh, it is like beyond the coolest thing. It has like, you know, a color display. It has like HF receive. It's like everything that you could possibly cram into a non-voice radio. It's <laughs> pretty incredible. It? He's he's managed to all paste it into uh into chat. Yeah. Yeah, it's that's, it's that's pretty the, incredible what he's doing. It really is. That's the only bit it has a built in digipeter self uh fill in digipeter. At least he had that in the V2. Uh, and is light and everything, but this latest one, it is uh, by far oh, neat. one of the coolest things that I've we seen. We got to get him and Don working together then. You know, it's funny, when I first discovered his very first version of this, the reason I came across it was uh, I was playing with the Dorji RF modules, and this was seven, eight years ago, probably now. That, that's what he's and, using there. Is he still using that? Because he was using that originally, and when I saw what he was doing, I thought, well, Hell, it's working. I, I I I had so many problems with those modules with like audio ramp up and all kinds of other issues. Um, I was looking for any clue from any other project I could find to figure out what was wrong. And um, so I so I guess he is still using that. That would explain is the one watt because those are one watt only. Yeah. Like I have like the light APRS tracker. The guy was it QRP Labs in Turkey. And I had the module go bad on me. And yeah. so I had a bunch of modules anyway. So I just, you know, soldered up a new one and got the thing working again. But yeah, those modules are not exactly uh, the most reliable. But for no, I, cost, I, you get what you I had for. several uh, test boards that I designed, including one uh, um, mini circuits makes a bandpass filter that's perfect for that range. So I have that bandpass. It's a little surface mount bandpass filter. I put that on the, my test board because, you know, that's one of the biggest complaints about those modules is they, they don't have any spurious uh, bandpass uh, filtering on the output. And um, I found that, you know, mini circuits made the perfect little surface mount in the range that it needed to be in. And I did all that. I even wrote my own little Visual Basic app for controlling it, for setting the frequency and everything. I did all that, and it worked. I couldn't believe it because I'm a shitty programmer, so I couldn't believe I got any of that working, but I did. And But the biggest issue was on transmit, no matter how much TX delay you put in or whatever, the audio would ramp up. And and you would think like, oh, I'll just put a really long TX delay in the radio, audio will ramp up, and then I'll feed it. Well, it turns out the audio starts ramping up as soon as it detects audio, and that was the issue I was running into. So I could never get it to transmit. It received. I actually got it to receive pretty well. The sensitivity was, you know, you know, neg neg one ten, you know, neg one oh five, somewhere in that. So the receive wasn't bad, but the transmit never could get working right. Yeah, I think what Tanner did is he put it on a delay, and I know he has, I think it's at least a three-pole LC, so it kind of smooths out the RF crap on the inside and the outside. Okay, okay. But I, I, you know, he, his his source code is closed. Oh, sure, he, sure. He, he keeps that a closely guarded secret. He made a little modification for me with mine of, like, my own special, because I wanted mm -hmm. to have it default to, like, a specific location local to me, not you know, Dusseldorf, Germany or whatever. Yeah. Where yeah. I heard this started from. <laughs> but, you know, he, he, he was like, this is for you, but yeah, good luck. You're not going to be able to kind of unpack it. You yeah. Know, yeah. <laughs> das ist nicht meine <laughs> <laughs> I speak German, so maybe I can, maybe I could talk to him. <laughs> hey, you never know. Well, I don't speak really well anymore, but okay, cool. Well, it's, it's, it's a neat, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, all, right, so, guys. all right, well, we all right. took it way too long. So thanks, guys. I always enjoy these chats.
Anybody have uh, anything? Uh, no, it's good that we, I was just thinking about that, actually. It's good that we've got like a nice uh, social gathering, you know, more than just once a year. So if I can push for it next year at Dayton, I want to get as many guys as to Dayton as possible and, and get together with everyone. I was there this year. That's I got together idea. with a couple of people, but man, it would be great to get the team together there. It'd be so yes, much fun. Would. My yes, hotel so room is already booked. Well, yeah, um, I think mine is. I, 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 my buddy books a block of rooms, and I think um, so that'd be a lot of fun just to get in the same room with everybody, go have some pizza, and talk this stuff because I love this stuff. I really. Well, do. for guys who are getting together at Nearfest this coming weekend, have a great time, and uh, we'll be there. Take with a picture you. or something for everybody. Yeah, get a group photo <laughs> and share it. Great idea. Yeah, we will. I'll make sure I remember that. No problem. Cool. Okay, cool. All right, guys. All right. Be safe. 7 3. Yep. Good night, everybody. Good night, all. Thanks. Take care. All right. Bye bye. Take care.